Good afternoon, church. I am really excited to kick off our new series here for the next few months about repentance. We, we didn't come up with some fancy title or anything. We are simply putting it repentance. And you're probably wondering, I hope you're wondering, why are we talking about repentance? You know, this is something that every Christian, every follower of Christ should already understand. If you've read through the scriptures at all, you've probably encountered this concept of repentance, and, and hopefully you've had a chance to practice it in your own life. But man, there's a lot of us who have a, an incomplete or maybe an immature understanding of repentance. For a long time in my walk with God, I had a really immature understanding of what repentance is and, and why we do it. And so it's always a very good time to talk about repentance. You know, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, we see another good reason to talk about repentance. It says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. We're going to come back to this passage in a little bit, but there's two key things here that I think definitely resonate with me. The first is that repentance leads to salvation. There's never a bad time to talk about salvation. And the second thing is that it leaves no regret. I don't want to live a life of regret and worldly sorrow. I want to have godly sorrow and repentance that leads to salvation. Sure hope that you do too. Your repentance is a massive part of a saving relationship with Jesus. And we're going to dig into how that works and what repentance is in a little bit. But before all that, we, we've got to make sure we understand what repentance is and why we do it. So the, the title of today's lesson, simply put, Understanding Repentance. You know, the what and the why of repentance can very easily be misunderstood. The how can actually be pretty easy. You know, hey, you were sinning in this way, now do this instead, right? That's a very simple understanding of what repentance is, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig a little deeper here in a minute. I think most of us know how to repent, but sometimes we can miss out on the key biblical understanding, the biblical definition of repentance. And because of that, we miss out on the why, why it's so important to repent. You know, what are we repenting of? What's the point? What should repentance lead towards? These are all important questions, and we're going to try to answer them in the course of this series as we dig into the Beatitudes. It's the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. You've probably read it before, but I'm really excited to take it a new spin on the Beatitudes. Talk about some really cool concepts regarding repentance plus Beatitudes. I don't want to give it all away. It's, it's awesome stuff, but you'll see next week. For today, understanding repentance. You know, the last reason why we're, we're digging into this idea, this, this series, is that repentance is a very desert concept. You know, this idea of desert, it's a place where we return to God or turn to God. And that, that idea fits perfectly in with how we're going to understand repentance by the end of this lesson. We're going to be returning to God. That's what you do in the desert. You go out there, it gets quiet, and you listen to God's voice. You return to the path that he's trying to put you on. That's what we're going to try to do for the next few weeks. We're going to look at the Beatitudes, talk about repentance, and try to return to God. Okay, so today's goal, pure and simple, we're going to try to recalibrate our understanding of repentance so that our Beatitude study can bear a crazy amount of fruit. Does that sound good? I can't hear you, but I'm going to bet that you gave me a thumbs up or something. Let's dig into it. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. And as we do that, I want to set the scene for us. So right here, this is a courtesy of our, our good friend Marty Solomon from the Bama podcast. Uh, it is a picture from a high point in Judea, which is where a large part of the Gospels happen. You probably see some, some familiar names there like Bethsaida, Capernaum, Magdala. Uh, you probably don't know Ramos Topos. Maybe you do. Uh, Chorazin gets mentioned by Jesus a few times. The, uh, get, uh, the Genesarat, the Genes I can't say it. First century Judea is where we set our scene. Uh, it's where Jesus grew up. It's where Jesus did his ministry. And it's so important, before we dig into any scriptures, it's so important that we put our minds into first century Judea. Because these scriptures, these interactions, these stories, they happened there. The context they have is a first century Judean context. 
And so we've got to put our minds there because here's the truth. This is kind of an exegetical concept. Big word, I know, but exegetical concept. The Bible can't mean something now that it didn't mean back then. I'll repeat myself. The Bible cannot mean something right now that it didn't mean back then. We want to get to the truth of the scriptures. We don't want to invent new truth out of the scriptures. We want to dig into what they were talking about back then. And so first century Judean mindset. For today and for every Sunday for the next few weeks, you are a first century Jew living in, let's say, Capernaum. Cool? Awesome. Matthew 3, verse 1. It reads, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts, yuck, and wild honey. That's okay. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So what's John preaching? Probably AD 30-ish. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And John represents what I would call kind of a repentance fever that was building up in first century Judea. You guys know how like memes become really trendy right now? You'll see a meme over and over again, or maybe, you know, uh, there's a really trendy commercial that you see on TV all the time. Repentance was kind of like that. It was a buzzword. Everybody was talking about repentance. It was trending. It was viral. Whatever, whatever 21st century word you want to use, that's what was going on with repentance. There was this, this swelling belief in Judea that God's people had gotten away from God's plan. God's people, the Jews, the Hebrews, had gotten away from God's plan. That's a dangerous place to be. And so they start talking about repent, believe, confess your sins, go out to the desert, get baptized. This repentance fever was, was kicking off in a huge way. And Jesus' message, the Sermon on the Mount, and all of his other teachings fit perfectly into this repentance fever. People were all about repentance. They wanted to repent, but they needed to understand what repentance was. And that's where Jesus comes in. That's where the Beatitudes come in, 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 in a lot of ways. Jesus comes in to thoroughly explain the idea of repentance for God's people. Now, that's a, a very important idea right there. Repentance for God's people. Who was repentance for? in the first century, in Judea. It was for God's people, people who already had a relationship with God. This is a really important concept. We're going to dig into a very deep understanding of repentance in a minute. But if you don't understand that repentance is for God's people, first and foremost, it's not going to make a lot of sense. Now, here's the truth. Repentance is for everybody. Maybe you've never prayed before. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God at all. Repentance can still be for you. But we can make the mistake that repentance is just for sinners. That's just for sinful people who don't know God. I'm already a Christian. I don't need to repent. That's a big mistake. I've been a Christian for 14 years. I have repented way more as a Christian in a relationship with God than I did beforehand. And the reason why is that even though Jesus forgives my sins, I still sin. I still fall short in the mark and I still fall short in my relationship with God and so I still need to continually repent. That's true of you and me and that's true of God's people in the first century as well. Repentance is first and foremost for God's people. And so the question for us is how do we understand repentance? Who do we think that repentance is for? Because if in my mind if repentance is for everybody else except for me, I'm probably not going to be repenting very much. I'm probably going to get into a lot of trouble not repenting of my sin. Repentance is for you and me and anybody who has a relationship with God. So let's get into some misunderstandings. I'm going to take you through a journey, quite a journey of my life, understanding, misunderstanding, re-understanding repentance. And I hope that 
a lot of these ideas resonate with you. Um, I hope that you're not stuck in any of these places that I've been stuck in, but if you are, just know that there is a deeper, more profound and fruitful place that you can get to, and, sh and hopefully you will get to, in your understanding of repentance. The first place is guilt. Check out 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8. I said we were going to come back here. In verse 8 it says, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. Amen. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings only death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. I want to start with the godly sorrow. That's the good one. That's the one that we want. But when I was a kid, a lot of times a teenager, and even now, every once in a while, I fall into worldly sorrow. And I would define that as guilt. Is guilt an entirely bad thing? No, because sometimes guilt leads to repentance. But sometimes we get stuck on guilt and we don't go anywhere with it. We get very guilty emotionally, but we don't back up our emotions with any sort of action. This is a, actually kind of a Catholic idea. It's this idea of penitence, which is you should feel really bad about what you did. And some people take that guilt and they go, okay, I've repented. That's not real repentance. That's actually a super immature understanding of repentance. If, for example, if I call my friend a bad name when I'm a little kid, and then I'm made to feel bad about it. Hey, you shouldn't have called Johnny that. And I go, oh no, I'm, I'm such a bad friend. Oh, I'm the worst. Oh no, I, I'm terrible. God doesn't like me. And then a week later, I call him the same name or something worse. Have I repented? No, I've just been guilty for a little bit. That's penitence. That's not repentance. This is all about emotion. And while godly sorrow that leads to repentance is a very good thing, a lot of times we settle for worldly sorrow, guilt, shame, and we don't go any further than that. So the first layer, the most immature understanding of repentance is guilt. The next step up is a little bit better. It's moralism. Moralism is better. Check out Luke 3 verse 7. It reads, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. This is a big repentance scripture. And I believe we see true repentance amongst these people, right? They want to be right with God. But on the negative side, on the immature side, we can fall into what's called moralism, which is you were bad, now be good. Is that wrong? No, not necessarily. And, and having morals, having a moral center is a very good thing. But repentance isn't just about bad and good. It's about something a little bit bigger than that, as we're going to get to in a second. But a lot of times we get stuck on, okay, I was bad. I did the wrong thing. What do I have to do to do the right thing? Moralism is really about action. Are my actions good? I did call Johnny a bad name. Now I'm going to call him a good name. Oh, you're my buddy. You're my friend, whatever. Now, that's good. Hey, you want to, you know, you want to be complimentary. You want to do good things and produce fruit in keeping with repentance. But sometimes, I know this would never happen to you, but to me, sometimes I would do the right thing, but my heart wouldn't be in it. That's not you though. You would never do that. But I'll, I'll confess, that's very much my heart sometimes. 
okay, I'll do the right thing. I'll say the right thing. But in my heart, I haven't changed at all. And that's moralism. I'm going to do the right things. But is my heart cut? Have I changed as a person? Or am I just doing the things that I think I'm supposed to do? That is, I, I ho hopefully you know by now, I'm a kingdom kid. I, I grew up in the church. That is a kingdom kid way of thinking. Any of my other kingdom kids, or if you grew up you know, in a, in a pretty Christian household, you definitely can relate to this. What can happen sometimes when we get caught in sin is we learn the wrong lesson. We don't learn to love God more. We don't learn to repent. We learn how to sin more creatively. If I get caught sneaking out of the house, my lesson is not don't sneak out of the house. My lesson is be sneakier. That's really bad. That's not good. That's doing the right things with the wrong heart. And that's moralism. The next step, we're on to step three, is metanoia. Ooh, a Greek word. Now we're getting somewhere. This has got to be Christian. And you're right. Hopefully you know this idea of metanoia. It's a Greek word. It means mind change. And if you read the Gospels in their original Greek, Koine Greek, you're going to find this word metanoia whenever the word repentance comes up. Mind change. I used to think this way. Now I'm going to think this other way. And, and metanoia is all about your attitude. It's all about your motives. It's not just about doing the right thing. It's about your heart actually changing. And metanoia is a really good thing. If you've gotten to a place in your faith where you know about metanoia and you strive for metanoia, and that's your idea of repentance, you are doing great. Good job. Metanoia is awesome. Metanoia is about genuine, deep inner change. It means your heart actually develops and you actually become more like Jesus. Amen. That's awesome. And that's where I was for a long time. Um, thank God, you know, in, in college-ish area of my life, I really started to understand this idea of metanoia. I started, you know, researching my Greek and getting all cool with my Greek stuff. And I started to see not just that I needed to treat people better. I started to understand that like the way I thought about them, the way I viewed people, my attitudes towards people were not changing. I didn't like that. I realized I wasn't becoming any more like Jesus. I wasn't getting any closer to God. I would, I would apologize. I'd feel guilty. I'd start doing the right things, but my heart wouldn't change towards people. And that's not metanoia. Metanoia, mind change, heart change, is about changing your attitudes. The way you view the world changes, and that's awesome. But there's one more step. This is a more recent one for me, and it might be new to you. Maybe it, maybe it won't be, and I hope it isn't, but this one rocked my world. And it's this Hebrew word, ooh, not Greek, but Hebrew, holy cow, this word teshuvah. Teshuvah means essentially returning to God's path. Now, when Jesus and John are saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near, they're not saying metanoia, because they didn't speak Greek. They spoke Hebrew and Aramaic. They said teshuvah, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Teshuvah, and believe the good news. Teshuvah is a serious step forward from metanoia, because teshuvah is about relationship. With metanoia, my heart changes. I become more like Jesus. Amen. That's awesome. But you can take it one step further by understanding repentance as fuel for your relationship with God. That's a big concept. It's huge. It's the idea that repentance returns me to the path that God set me on. Remember like 10 minutes ago, I was talking about first century Judea and repentance fever and God's people getting off of God's path. Let's put the pieces together for a second here, shall we? God's people were getting off of God's path and they needed to tushuva and return to the path, return to God's ways. For us in the 21st century, I hope that we can understand repentance the same way. As God's people, as a royal priesthood, as we've been talking about, as partners to God, as we've been talking about for the last few months, 
we get a chance to return to God's path. Not just change our attitudes, not just develop a better heart, even though that's great stuff, to return to God and find deeper relationship with God. That is repentance with a purpose. You can become a better and better person with no purpose. You know, just becoming a better person as a means to an end. It's an end unto itself. But there's this next step that we're able to take where repentance becomes about relationship. Because I want to get back to my relationship with God, I'm going to repent of my sin. That's a big, big concept. Check out Acts 26 in verse 20. Paul is speaking here. He's defending himself on trial. Acts 26 verse 20, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. This is so crucial for us. Repentance is about continual returning to the path. You know, if you're on the straight and narrow and then sin takes you off of God's plan for your life, we need to steer back and get back on God's path. That is what repentance is. Repentance can't just be an end unto itself. It's got to lead somewhere. And the place that God is trying to lead us through this grace of repentance is into deeper relationship with him. What it all comes down to, if you want to blend these two definitions together, if you want to blend metanoia and teshuvah together, you get radical, consistent mind change leading to a transformed relationship with God. Radical, consistent mind change leading to a transformed relationship with God. That's too wordy for you. Simply put, it is a returned mind. My mind, my heart, my spirit has been returned to the place that God intended. God intends us to live spiritual, faithful, sinless lives. That, that was his intention for us from the beginning. But we stray away. We get upset with each other. We lash out. We get deceitful. We, we get impure. We fall into a billion different sins. And so we've got to return back to the path that God intended for us. This is the working definition that we're going to use for the next six or seven weeks. A returned mind. Radical, consistent mind change leading to a transformed relationship with God. Metanoia plus teshuva. That is repentance. So what does this all lead to? What's the point? What's the why of repentance? The why of repentance is relationship. And as we're going to see in the Beatitudes, we don't just go from bad to good. We don't just feel guilty. We don't even just change our hearts. We change our hearts and it leads to deeper relationship. Check this out in the Beatitudes. You know, maybe you used to be vengeful, vengeance, avenging yourself. Well, now you're called to be a peacemaker, to shuva, to peacemaking. And you know what the promise is? You're going to be called a son of God. That is a relational teshuva ending to this kind of repentance. Maybe you used to be boastful. Well, repent and become meek. And guess what? You're going to inherit the earth. A son inherits from his father. That means relationship. Inherit the earth means relationship. Maybe you used to be impure. Now be pure in heart and you're going to see God in the Beatitudes we get the template of repentance. Not just you were bad and now be good. Not even just change your heart and change your attitudes. Change your heart and you're going to find deeper relationship with God. That means a transformed life. Not just a transformed heart. Not just a transformed mind. Not just being a better person, whatever that means. That means you are now closer to God than you have ever been. 
Don't be a peacemaker because it's the right thing to do. Don't just be a peacemaker because it makes you feel warm and fuzzy inside. Be a peacemaker so you can be called a son of God. Relationship. Teshuvah. That is the plan that God has for us. Return to the path that God intends for your life. I, I hope and I pray that we can contemplate these ideas this week and beyond as we start to dig into the Beatitudes, as we start to understand repentance in a whole new light. I'm so excited to talk about this stuff, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, the, all this today in our discussion groups, our breakout groups. I've got two questions for us that I'd like for us to discuss for uh, six, seven, eight minutes. The first question, I encourage you again, take out your phone, take a picture of this, I'm giving you as much time as I can give you to take the picture. Hopefully by now you've gotten it. The first, the first one, which definition of repentance do you resonate with the most? Are you prone to guilt? Maybe you're a moralist or maybe you, you understand metanoia or maybe you understand teshuvah. That's awesome. Which one do you resonate with the most? Which one do you lean towards? Second question, how do you think a greater focus on repentance would change your relationship with God? If you focused a little more on repentance, if you thought more deeply about repentance, how would your relationship with God change? What would be different? What would be better? That's stuff that I'm really excited just to explore with you, uh, not just today, but over the course of the next couple weeks. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you so much for the ways that you give to the church, for the ways that you eagerly desire a relationship with God. I, I've spent the last week or so thinking about my place in our church, just to end on a personal note here, um, and how, how joyful and how incredible it's been for the last seven months since Allie and I moved here. We felt so at home and so taken care of. And a big reason why we feel safe here is that we feel like we're in a congregation that desperately desires relationship, not just with one another, but relationship with God. And to be in a place where we know how badly you guys want that and how much you guys love God, it makes us feel safe. I hope you feel safe in our congregation. I hope you feel like you're growing closer to God and that teshuvah, returning to the path, doesn't feel out of reach, but it feels very close indeed for you. Excited to talk about these things together. I love you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday.